Welcome to Firm Foundation. In these times of shifting standards and faulty foundations, there is a solid place on which to build a victorious life. And that place is the firm foundation of Jesus Christ and the Word of God. Your host for Firm Foundation is Brian Hudson, a Bible teacher, pastor, author, and producer of Life Enriching Media. I want to today pick up on a scripture we shared in the teaching on yesterday. We had a great presentation from Jonathan, had a great word yesterday, and I shared a message as well. And, and that was a part of the text yesterday that stayed with me all day uh, and into the night and, to the, and this morning. woke up with the same text on my mind and my heart. So let's go first to Psalm 16, verse 11. We have uh, some slides today for you. And I want to begin with this text way back in history, long before Jesus was born. And it says this, the psalmist said, David said, Psalm 1611, you have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence and eternal pleasures at your right hand. Amen. There is joy in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Say there is, joy there is joy in the presence of the Lord. Amen. And I would be safe in saying there is not joy not real joy outside of God's presence. Now, we're always in the presence of God, in a manner of speaking, but sometimes we're not focused on the presence. And so when we're not in the presence, our joy is affected. And we'll see what joy actually is in a moment. All right, Luke 2. Here's the Christmas story, part of the Christmas story. I'm going to pick up part of the story after Jesus Christ, after Mary and after Joseph and Mary went to Bethlehem and no room at the end. We know the story. He was sent around. It was sent around to the back and to the stable area. And Christ was born in a manger, in a, in a feeding trough, basically. And so while the innkeeper, you know, was too busy to see what God was doing, the shepherds who were in a quiet place indeed could hear what God was doing and hear and see what God, hear and see what God was doing. So it says in verse 8, now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid, just shocked by this experience. Then the angel of the Lord said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to many People, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Let me stop here now. The phrase that got my attention was the part when the angel said, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. And my title to the message today is Good Tidings of Great Joy. Say good tidings, good tidings of great joy. Now, good tidings means a good announcement, good news, something that we need to know. And so the Bible says that Jesus is bringing to the world this good news, these glad tidings. Now, we call it the gospel, the gospel today. But he says that this, these, this glad tidings is going to be great joy. For all people. Now, as Bertha said, people don't know what they don't know. So there is joy available to people, and they don't even know it. There's joy available, and a lot of folks don't know it yet because we haven't told them, for one, or they haven't heard. But the point to this, this whole announcement and the whole coming of Jesus, that we celebrate Christmas, we celebrate his birth, that's a great thing, but we celebrate the reason that he was born, the reason he came, the reason he lived and died and rose again. And so we have the Christmas story, and we have the Easter story, you know. So Christmas is a great thing, but we've kind of made Christmas out to be, it's still a good thing, but it's out to be more of just activities and parties and so forth, which is fine. But we need to keep in mind what the angel said, that I'm bringing you and he'll bring you Good tidings. I'm bringing you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. 
Then it said, For there is born to you this day in the seed of David, Christ the Lord. Christ was born. So the answer and the source of the joy that is to come has been born. He was born today in this city of David. Amen. Now, that's what I'm thinking about here as we go forward in this message and in this whole season is that we will understand what joy is, how important it is to have joy. And that joy comes from receiving knowledge of something. Joy comes from receiving impartation of something or somebody, Jesus Christ. And so that we want to make sure that we're looking at joy the right way, that we're walking in joy and receiving joy and recognizing what joy is. Now, our next scripture is Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. New Living Translation says, Always be full of the joy of the Lord. I say again, rejoice. Amen. Always be full of the joy. How can be always full? What does that mean, be full? Well, the joy of the Lord is the presence of God in your life. The joy of the Lord is your acknowledgement and recognition of Jesus who has come, the son who was born. He came to give us life. And so there are all these things, all these factors that God has brought around us and into us that he wants us to focus on to have the joy in our hearts and lives. Because when there's not joy, there's going to be, you know, sadness and so forth. Now, now we don't say happiness because happiness, we know that happiness is, is good, but it's different than joy. Amen, somebody. Amen. I mean, I'm not happy every day. You know, I was sitting, <laughs> Pat and I was sitting there on our date night. We was watching a movie on TV. I just feel happy all of a sudden, you know. I feel happy, you know. And then in the morning, I felt, didn't feel as happy, you know. It just it had that night and went away. It's like, where did happiness go, you know? <laughs> but happiness is like that. Now, if you try, try to manufacture it and keep it going, then you, kind of be, you become kind of frivolous and you become kind of shallow, you know. You, you know, you're trying to do things to be happy that don't amount to much. But when you have the joy of the Lord, you always have the joy of the Lord. You always have the joy. And so that joy has come because Jesus came and did something in the earth. And he did something in you. He has and is revealing life and light. God is doing enough in us to keep us focused on his resources, on his things, on his sources. Amen. You know, the sources are important. I read a lot. I read books. I read news. I read journals and such. I'm taking information in all ways. It's important to my ministry and to the business and so forth. And there's news out there to take in. I, I read news as well. But I got to be careful with stuff in the world. I got to be very selective. Amen. I mean, I don't need to have the same information over and over again all day. You know, I get my news in the morning, whatever. I may check it. But sometimes we get so hyped up, you know, on hopped up uh, on, on this. On this <laughs> hopped up is, a, is, a, is a, a term meaning high, you know. We get so hopped up on, on these other sources out here that we don't realize it's affecting your joy. It's affecting your joy. It's affect so we have to understand the importance, as, as the psalmist, as a proverb said, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Amen? All right. Now, Nehemiah 8. Nehemiah chapter 8. Now, this, is, this particular verse, chapter and verse, was after they had built the wall, they had endured all the trials, had succeeded in the task against all these enemies. So the celebration was on. Nehemiah 8, verse 10 says, Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. That's that phrase we've often heard. The joy of God is your strength. And that came, that came out of their experience working with God. And God working with them. It was more than a saying. It's more than a saying. It was a reality. It was something happening in the moment. 
It is something that sustained them through that arduous task and against all odds, against all the enemies. So those are the texts I want to give you. Now let me go back a little bit. Let me give you some, a definition of joy. Two definitions of joy that I've just come up with in my thinking here, my, in my prayers. First of all, joy is the knowledge of God's grace through Jesus Christ. Please hear that. Joy is the knowledge or and or satisfaction of God's grace through Jesus Christ. So, you know, James said, count it all joy when you fall into diverse testings, knowing this. Remember that? That, that through this test, you'll be perfected, you'll be strengthened. So what you know, what you know is a basis for your disposition, for your outlook. Therefore, even joy, joy is the knowledge of God's grace. It's the, it's the satisfaction of having God's grace. It's, it's knowing what you have on the inside. That's why joy is independent of all your circumstances. You can have joy in the midst of the worst circumstance. Because what you know about something, nothing can touch that. Nothing can, nothing can touch or change what you know, except you. If you choose not to focus on it, then it, it changes. But the joy is the knowledge of God's grace. And God's grace is, is manifold. God's grace is, it never ends. Amen. It's abundant. There's no end of God's grace. There's no, there's no tapping it to the point where there's nothing left anymore. There's always more grace. Amen. And second, joy is the knowledge and satisfaction of knowing that you're in the will of God. Now, I believe this is a long time. This is what God gave me. I think it holds true to this day that joy is the knowledge and or satisfaction of knowing the knowledge of knowing <laughs> you're in God's will. Because sometimes, we you know, we don't uh, we know stuff, and don't really realize it. So the knowledge of knowing it is the awareness of it that we're in God's will. Now, so then when you do what God says do and you fulfill, for example, yesterday, a great day. We had a lot of uh, no shows, very disappointing. Folk didn't come. But that didn't change the joy of what we did. They see that when you're in the will of God and when you're doing God's will, that's, it, it just lifts you up and it separates you from everything else. You hear what I'm saying? Sometimes it's the only thing that can keep you is that is the joy of the Lord is your strength. Because when you know that you're in God's will, doing God's will, when you know that God's grace is at work through Jesus Christ, when you know this through faith, you know this and you're experiencing it, then that becomes a space for you that will keep you. That will keep you. Amen, somebody. Amen. Hallelujah. I mean, we wish that. You know, we want things to line up for us and, and go well for us. And many times things, it happens. Sometimes anything lines up and it lines up for you and goes well for you. You can smile at it. Oh, praise God, you know. But that don't happen every day. Now, you can watch a game show and feel like that every day. You watch the game, watch Price is Right. You can, ooh, yes, yes. You can, be, you can go that way. You know what I'm saying? And just find yourself some thrills and, and, and stay in the drill. Uh, Find, find a thrill and just work with it. You know, go to a movie and look for some. I mean, that's all. I, I get that. But when all that stuff is said and done, you got to find something inside of you. I mean, in the world, people go get a drink. They go to the bar. You know what I'm saying? They go with it. They move it uh, uh, a show called Cheers. Go somewhere. Everybody knows your name. You got to go to the bar. To find somebody that knows your name, you know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, people are just looking for ways to be happy and be encouraged. I get it, but it's most important to let the joy of the Lord be your strength. That's why Jesus came. He came glad, he came to give the glad tidings of great joy that would be for all people. That's that is a promise right there. That's a resource that became available when Jesus came. This is what sustained Nehemiah 
and the people in his day. In fact, let's go back and look a little closer at this. At Nehemiah chapter 1, let's go back to the beginning here. Verse 2, it says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, it came to pass in the month of Chisley, in the 20th year, I was in Sushan, the citadel, and they said to me, the survivors who are left in the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. So it was, when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Now, why would, why would Nehemiah have this reaction, having never lived in Jerusalem? He's, you know, he's born and raised in Babylon. He's, they were in captivity 70 years by then. But the Bible says, watch where he lived. The Bible says that he was in Sushan, the citadel. That is, he was in a palace. Nehemiah lived in a palace. He was a cup holder, okay, to the king. So Nehemiah was in a place of comfort and privilege. He was. I mean, he was in captivity, but they were not being beaten. I mean, been, Israel in Babylon were not like slaves in the south back in the day. These folk had houses and lands and businesses, and they, they were thriving there. But the thing is, they weren't home. They were not where they were supposed to be. They, were, they, they had, listen, Nehemiah had privilege and status, but it did not have joy. You cannot have joy living outside the will of God. You can have everything else in the world. All the stuff, all the accoutrements. But without, without living in God's will, there is not going to be joy. So, so what happened was that hearing the news of the disrepair of you know, Jerusalem and the walls broken down, and the people scattered, and those who were living there were in distress, realizing at that moment, maybe having realized it for the first time in a long time, if ever, that, my goodness, wait a minute, now I'm up here, and they're down there, and, and then knowing the history of the people of Israel, they, you know, their, their homeland is Jerusalem and Israel, not way up here in Babylon. So that's what touched his heart and made him feel compassion for the people in his homeland, in his homeland where he'd never been, realizing this is where God wants us to be. Now, this is the beginning of how this man began to walk into the joy of the Lord. Because the joy of the Lord isn't just what you feel after something good happens. The joy of the Lord is a promise to you. It's a promise like we heard in the text. It's a promise of glad tidings which will be for all people. There's something God wants to do. But he needs to get us to focus on it. He needs to get us to see it first. So um, Nehemiah, God's message to him was the word and, the, and we heard report from his homeland, from Jerusalem. That's what God used to motivate him to seek God's will. And so now he was in a place where I would call it. He was actually <laughs> in, in Sushan, in this palace he was kind of living in a comfortable captivity. You know what I'm saying? He was in captivity, but he was comfortable. He was so comfortable, leaving it didn't cross his mind. Happens to people sometimes. People get comfortable in their captivity. But the Lord, if, it's, if you're a believer, the Lord's going to deal with you about about. His purposes and his will being done. Amen. I don't, I don't think that you have to be uncomfortable to serve God. I'm just saying it's where, it's, it's where our focus is that determines the joy of the Lord. It's where we determine that we're in God's will. That's what helps us recognize the joy of God. And so then when you get into God's will, that knowledge and satisfaction, that always stands above everything else. That's why in Africa, what I always remarked on and among the people in various conditions of living I mean, some were desperately in poverty, but I did not, I did not see that. I didn't sense that from the people. I didn't get that, I'm, I'm poor, woe is me. I didn't get that from the people, from the believers. I just saw dignity. I saw they praised God. I saw them, you know, coming all the way across, you know, long distance to come to services and stuff. I just, 
I just saw, I just, you know, I didn't, I saw the poverty. They, they're aware of it. But because <laughs> when you have the joy of the Lord, that becomes your strength. When you know you have strength, it's hard to complain about stuff. You can recognize it and say, this, this got to come up. This can be better. But it's difficult to live in complaining when you, when you know that God is helping you and you're in God's will. I mean, people, our ancestors endured a lot before we came to our place in life of having our own properties and homes and cars and boating. And how did people, why wasn't everybody sad back in the day? All the time. Think about that. Why was somebody back in the day, I mean, Dad, why were you happy sometimes and had joy back in the day? Well, he wasn't saved his whole life, you know what I'm saying? But, I mean, after becoming saved, why do people, do believers, I'll say, believers, not complain all the time when there's so much to complain about? Because you have the joy of the Lord, who is your strength. And sometimes that joy makes you happy. Make you happy. That's a, that's a good thing. In fact, I'd rather be happy because of joy than because of some money. Okay, money come and money go, you know. How that works. So, now, so then here's, here's, here is Nehemiah in Sushan, living in a palace. And yet he realized, my life is not complete. I'm not in the will of God. I don't have the joy of God like I need to have. So the story goes on, you know, he talked to people, they were motivated, they all went. And, and so we, we kind of skip ahead. And so we look, look uh, Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15 says this. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elul in 52 days. My, my, my. He says, and it happened when all our enemies heard of it, that all the nations around us saw these things and they were very disheartened in their own eyes. For they perceived that this work was done by our God. Isn't that something? So because, listen, when, when Nehemiah got into the will of God, then the joy of God rose up in him. And see, joy motivates you. Motivation doesn't come, well, motivation can come in different ways. Somebody can encourage you, somebody can ask you to do something, somebody can, you know, whatever, assign you. But motivation, that way doesn't last. You can hear something, be excited about it, want to go get that thing. That doesn't last. What, what lasts is what you believe on the inside of you. What, what, what persists is what you believe is God's will for you. And so when Nehemiah captured the vision of going back to help the people and rebuild the walls in the city, he told the other people in Babylon the same thing. And all of a sudden, man, he sparked in them the same joy, the same prospect of joy. You follow me? And so that it's contagious when, when, you're, when you have joy at, at the purpose of, and will of God and the promise of God doing something and that stirs you up, you can use that. God uses that to stir other people up. I mean, I, what, what better way to be motivated as a believer than, than God's joy? Amen? Now, Pastor Jerry told me that he's going to, going to, uh, to uh, Eldoret in, in June, Lord willing. So he told the church and so he put out the church and 21 people signed up to go to to uh, Kenya. Now, don't praise God yet. That do sound good. But he knows, we talk, he laughed, we look, he said, once they see the cost and realize the distance and get a picture uh, of what we have to do, where you're going to stay and all this, then they'll have to they'll re reconsider. I mean, when you hear something, you just want to, oh, yeah, yeah, let's jump in that. But once you, once you start counting the cost, only, only joy is going to keep you on that. Only joy can keep you in that purpose. And even with that, 
it may be God's will for you not to go or wait to go next time. All I'm saying is, see, we react to stuff. That's, that's something normal. But the response we need is the faith of God and the joy of God in us. Amen? So by the time June comes, there'll be less people, you know. And that's fine. In fact, it's better. It's hard to travel. I mean, I can imagine, I mean, six people is too much, in my view, because the little vehicles, I mean, listen, y'all, they got little, it's, they're little people, okay? Little people got small cars, all right? <laughs> Everything's small. Everything's small over there. So, and Americans, I mean, we're tall. Some of us are wide, you know what I'm saying? But the thing is, you have to get, you get four or five vehicles for all them people. That, that's possible. That's going to cost more. So I'm saying it's possible, and it's going to happen. But the people that are going to go, it'll work out just fine. My point, though, is that the joy of the Lord has to be a motivator. Excitement won't get you through. Amen, somebody? Amen. Luke 2. Let's finish up here. Luke chapter 2. So let's go back to our opening text again. So again, they, by, the, by the grace of God, through the joy of the Lord, they built the wall in 52 days. The wall was finished. They had to hang the gates and stuff, but the wall was done. And, and the celebration began, you know, in ch chapter 8, where it says, you know, eat the fat, you know, um, eat, drink the sweet, eat the fat, all this, for a joy of God's your strength. That's part of the celebration. That's the joy kind of being released in celebration after the work is completed. But believe me, the joy doesn't come after the work. The joy has to be there during the work. The joy must begin at the start of the work when you capture the vision, when God's grace gets involved with you. That's where, that's where the joy starts. And that joy is the knowledge and satisfaction of being in God's will. It is the knowledge of God's grace. And that knowledge never leaves you. That knowledge never leaves you. And you find yourself constantly relying on that knowledge. Amen? Amen. On that trip, or, or a mission trip again, every, every step of the trip, from the flights to the transportation to the roads. I mean, we even wound up one time in a van, and the thing was on E. And it, it, now, we're in the city, but he, he figured we can get to the gas station. But there was, a, there was construction uh, in the middle of the road blocking the whole street. So we had to divert and go around. And any diversion off of a paved road takes you to a dirt road. You don't divert. You don't reroute on more pavement. There's only one, there's one paved way to go someplace. If you get off of that, you're on the dirt, okay? So he had to divert. And so then, but the diversion had a backup because everybody's diverting. See? And this thing's on E, okay? So, so... You know, we all know it, but the thing is, you know, you have to, Lord, thank you. Get us to the gas station, you know. So sure enough, you know, we made it. We made it. He made one, two, three turns. We got to the gas station, got some gas. Praise God. But that's, that's life. I mean, life is full of opportunities and moments where you got to just make sure the joy of God is still working in you. you. Can't lose your mind over the thing going on E. If it had, if it had gone to E, you got, to, you got to go hoof it. You got to walk. You get out there and walk or, or whatever. Call for somebody to bring you some gas. I mean, the point is, whatever is going to happen, your joy will not diminish. If you have the joy of God, it does not go away. A crisis do not remove your joy. Right. If you never had joy, that's a different story now. But if you have joy, I mean, walking in joy, no kind of crisis it's going to take your joy away. You may be sad. You may be heavy. I mean, it's going to be rough in there. But the joy of the Lord is going to be your strength. Say the joy of God joy is always my strength. Always. Amen. So we come back now to the opening text. Just want to read this again. Good tidings. I'm bringing you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. Then it said, for there is born to you this day in the seed of David, Christ the Lord. I, I was looking for a picture of the angels and the shepherds and having the encounter. And this one appeared to be, it just struck me as being the most 
accurate, you know. I've seen a lot of stylized pictures, but, but this one here, because the Bible said there was first one angel that spoke, and then a whole a lot of angels appeared after that, the Bible says. And they lit up that area. It was nighttime, but their presence lit up the sky, lit up the ground. That just strikes me as being a very, you know, a realistic picture of what they, of what they experienced. Amen? Praise God. Now, you know, you don't get to see that in your life. I've never seen angels, you know, that I'm aware of. But, you know, this, this is a picture of an event that happened that inspired these shepherds and that launched a whole movement. And that from this, Jesus was born that day. And, and so then he has brought these, these uh, what a glad tidings came from the angels. But the, but the joy that would be to all men, that's what Jesus brought. And so I just say to you, receive that joy. It's out there. It's there. It's always there for you. Amen. And if you don't sense it, then just, just pray. Open your heart to God because it's certainly there. Everything God promised is available to you always. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you today. For your word, thank you for encouraging us today, reminding us of what it means, Lord, to to have received a savior uh, into our hearts. He was born on that day uh, many, many centuries ago. Lord, that life that he brought into the world, that joy he brought, Lord, is still influencing and impacting people through the Holy Spirit the gospel message that we preach, to the word of God that has been given to us.